The views and opinions expressed by guests on the TWBC podcast are solely those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the views of nor constitute an endorsement by the host, TWBC, or the advertisers. National Championships, Confederation Championships, World Championships, major professional events. For over three decades, he has been there for many of the sport's greatest moments. And now he brings you even closer to the movers and shakers in the world of high echelon tournament water skiing. From the founder and creator of the Water Ski Broadcasting Company comes the TWBC Podcast. And now here's your host, Tony Lightfoot. Well, greetings, salutations, and a welcome to all to this uh, latest edition of the TWBC podcast. I am the aforementioned uh, Tony Lightfoot, and uh, in uh, this episode, or one of the first episodes of the new year that is 2022, I bring on a very uh, special guest, a uh, long-time uh, uh, competitor, uh, pretty much a super fan of the of the sport of a uh, tournament water skiing, and uh, the, uh, the head... Uh, head honcho of the uh, the baller spray website uh, which continues to like break records left right and center for uh, for a water ski centric uh, website his name is john horton how are you doing today sir doing good tony uh, stoked to be on your podcast uh great way to start the year Absolutely, absolutely. So, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people uh, will, will be will be eager to find out uh, what your take is on certain issues and that kind of stuff. I mean, you I mean you haven't shied away from offering up uh, your opinions here, there, and everywhere. But we kind of start us off by starting at the beginning. So, how how did John Horton get into this funny old game that is tournament water skiing? Uh, you know, uh, I didn't really have a choice. I was born into it. Uh, my dad uh, built the world's first tournament ski lake back in uh, 1968. And, I mean, honestly, if he hadn't done it, somebody else would have. But uh, he'd kind of been thinking about the project for years. And then when he moved to California, uh, there's so little water ski access in Los Angeles that he went out into the Mojave Desert and kind of to an impossible area. You'd look at it and think you wouldn't build water ski lakes there. It, it, and, it's close uh, enough to Death Valley, isn't it? Well, no, not exactly. It's If you draw a line between Los Angeles and Vegas, uh, Newberry Springs is there. Death Valley is... Uh, Death Valley is not that close. I confess I've never been to Death, Death Valley. It's not, it's not right around the corner, but the Mojave Desert is hot and dry and you wouldn't think there was water there and actually uh, as of 2022 there's not enough water there that you would build a new ski lake but in 1968 the water table was high and water was cheap and so the year i was born water went in the lake and so uh kind of just quick other notes about my dad he was uh usa water ski board of directors he was the team doctor for the u.s world team a number of times so the short version of that is i grew up in a water ski family uh, i think we've got four generations at this point who have competed at nationals so born into it didn't really have a choice all right then you mentioned uh, stuff being cheap in 1968 now you <laughs> now continue to live in california nothing is cheap there now huh no, no, and you know my wife and I, we, uh, I don't, I don't want to announce something, but we're always talking about trying to get out of here. So believe me, if I could escape the People's Republic of California, uh, I would. Um, but that's that's a subject for a different show, I think. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but uh, but I mean, every, every, everyone, every, everyone that I know within the sports knows that John Horton has has an, has an association has a tie in with the uh, with, with with the with the golden state of uh, California but obviously that's the, that's politics for a whole other time you know e e even though having said that you know the politics that goes there with gasoline prices and all that kind of stuff you know because without gasoline we wouldn't have a sport uh, uh, you know that that kind that kind of deal you know so i mean the I mean, you can we can mention it. We could mention a lot about that until the cows come home. So, you're involved well, in this. You know, yeah, you know, Tony. I actually want to challenge that. I I read people. I mean, I don't want to challenge you on that, but 
let me just make a statement that drives me insane. I read on a regular basis on my forum people talking about the price of gas, which is painful and it is real. But when you own a hundred thousand dollar boat um, and you've got a two thousand dollar ski, and the average ski ride is about one point two gallons, and the price of gas goes up by a dollar, and your your focus is holy crap, my ski ride cost me a dollar ten more than it did last year. I kind of think you're focusing on the wrong stuff. You've you've got you you've 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 got you've got a very good point there. I mean, obviously, with the amount with the amount that goes on boats and skis and all that kind of equipment, competition entry fees, insurance, uh, for crying out loud, exactly, I mean, it, exactly. It's, you know, I mean, is I mean, it's just just a tip of tip of the tip of a very very large iceberg. But do you? I mean, but with everything else. Uh, that runs on 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 a gas engine seeming to be uh, perceived as evil in in the Goldwood state of California. Do you kind do you kind of get get a little bit of the sense that 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 maybe maybe the sport because it runs on gasoline is under the crosshairs a little bit from from the from those who I would hasten to add would be. I don't know, quote unquote, tree huggers type deal, you know, in terms of being legislated off the water type deal. No, I don't. I don't experience that. I mean, California has its own unique problems since we're, I guess we're going to go there is mm -hmm. so it is literally lack of access. You know, uh, I forget how, let's say Los Angeles County is in excess of 20 million people. Well, there is no ski club currently that you can join within two hours of Los Angeles where you can show up with your boat. Well, actually, I mean, that's not true. There's one that's, that's not, you know, there's, there's one place where you could possibly show up with your boat and put it in the water and ski. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I own the house I'm sitting in now on a ski lake is because I had to buy my own house on a ski lake to have my own access. It's the only way I could ski without bumming rides off friends. So, South of Sacramento, access to the sport, when I mean, you look at it, it's, it's the most populous, most wealthy state in the union. Mm -hmm. Access to water skiing below Sacramento is astronomically difficult. And so, you know, and, and we you talk to, about, yeah. Until you get to San Diego and Imperial and those places and El Centro well, type deal. Well, no, not true either. Because you go to San Diego and yes, you can go ski in the bay. That's mm -hmm. true. There's 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 a little bit of saltwater skiing, but that access is, I don't think it's used a whole bunch. But then if you go to El Centro, again, you're going to fork out 400 grand or 500 grand for a house at Imperial to ski. Wow. There's no ski club there. If you're, if, if you, it, it's not like you're in, uh, you're in West Palm and you can pay whatever, 15 bucks a year for your membership at Okahili and go ski. Um, you know, the, the problems of skiing in the Golden State are massive. Now, you move up to Sacramento and the amount of skiing and access is fantastic. Actually, um, if I could convince my wife to move to Sacramento, mm. uh, and not, not an option for other reasons, but... Um, but, you know, Sacramento is if, – if people are looking for a place to be a water skier, to go and have access without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, it is a fantastic option. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean, if you pull up Google Earth or anything like that, and you and you, and you like go a little bit to, to the left towards Bakersfield and that kind of stuff, you got rows upon rows of lakes. But I mean, have 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 they have, have they had trouble keeping water in those lakes and keeping them to where they're actually skiable? No, no, no. All these lakes are here, but again, there is no public access. If you haven't purchased your own lot, you can't put your boat in the water. Mm -hmm. So so that's my point is if you live in Los Angeles and you want to come ski at Bakersfield, where I am now, you're going to have to shell out at least 200 grand um, for a place. And then you're going to, you know, and then you've got HOA dues and whatever else. Um it is a problem for somebody who is looking to come into the sport. I know we're I know we're squirreling way off into left field on this, but yeah, it's for, something I'm passionate about that it is so difficult to live in this state and be involved in the sport. Yeah, I mean, because because uh, I mean, I I, ju I just spoken uh, to, uh, to 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 a friend of mine who I mean, 
I mean, had, 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 has access, continues to have access, you know, and actually brings his friends along to give them an opportunity to try the, the sport, of, sport of water skiing, whether it be two skis behind the boat, whether it getting up on one or that type of stuff. I mean, I mean that's considerably easier for him considering that he lives, he lives, in, ten, he lives in Tennessee type deal. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a drastic difference, you know, trying to, trying to get people into the sport. I mean, from what you're telling me is demonstratively more difficult in the Golden State than it is in the Volunteer State or, or, any, or, or places like Florida, right? I, I would imagine so. I mean, any – well, again, in Sacramento, you can just show up at Bellacqua or Liquid Zone or Valentin or all these places – and for a reasonable amount of money, you can just show up and buy a ride with current boats and great drivers and that. Below Sacramento, it just doesn't exist. All right, then. So uh, let's move on a little bit yeah. from access to the sport because one, because if, you, if anyone Googled the sport of tournament water skiing, eventually – uh, there were well, I, I wouldn't say eventually because one of the sites that pops up on a Google search is Ball of Spray, and you've been the uh, the main architect of that website to, since its inception. So let's go to the beginning. How long have you been involved with Ball of Spray? And, and I mean, what what was the genesis? I mean, what 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 gave you gave you the epiphany to say, hey, listen, uh, there ain't enough water skiing online, and Let's put this up on there. So the site as it exists today, uh, I believe is about mid-December 2009. But before that, what had happened is I'd been away from the sport for about seven years. Uh, after college, I kind of went off and was living in L.A. and wasn't skiing much. And then when I moved to Bakersfield and started skiing again, I'd gone online and – I was I was trying to go down the rabbit hole of learning more technical stuff about slalom. I was looking for people who knew as much more than I did as I could find, right? I was I was desperate for why do we do this thing? Why is this stuff important? How does this make my skiing better? And I pretty much didn't find anything. I had wandered over to Ski Fly and this time it wasn't incredibly toxic over there, but I asked some questions and kind of got crickets. And I don't know that my questions were good or compelling, but I was frustrated that I was looking for information, couldn't find it. So, so I went off. Go ahead. So that so basically, it, it was it was it was it was an effort to try and get more than what was out there in terms of of commenting and trying to, to help you out with questions that you had about your own skin and trying to improve from a technical aspect. hundred percent. It was, it was a search for knowledge. So I started a little, a little form that wasn't even called ball spray at the time. And, you know, the original guys, I got to give shout out to like Ward McLean and Bruce Butterfield and Dwight Woodbridge. And, you know, a couple of guys that have been there since the very beginning. And we had this little forum and it did its thing, and then I started doing um, uh, carbon fins. I don't know if you remember that. I was making fins out of carbon fiber. And yes, I still have with... one, and I still have the calipers for it. Excellent. And I think with the the skis of that era, I think that technology was really uh, valid. And I I think when skis got better, I think when materials changed in the ski world, those fins didn't aren't as valid anymore and so we've kind of went away from them but the point is is i built myself some some notoriety and i i could not have built ball of spray if i hadn't built carbon fins first because people got excited about the fins my name got re-exposed to the sport even though i'd been you know skied national since i was a little kid and all mm -hmm. um so eventually i went and thought well i'm gonna make like a more of a real site out of this thing and when i built the, the real site it just kind of took off and Traffic has more or less grown uh, every year up to a, a peak of like 8 million page views a year since then. Wow. I mean, 8 million page views. I mean, that's I mean, that that is that is tremendous growth from uh, from, from what you experienced uh, from you started in in 2009, did you say? Or, or was it earlier? Yeah. yeah. So well, 2000, 
2009 is the is the is the site as it exists today. There was a couple of years with a little forum. I don't even know what it was called anymore. Mm-hmm. So 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 starting from a relatively small forum, you've now you you now uh, have have a have a site that the majority of people that go to the uh, to, to the website itself. I mean, I mean, there are there are a number of things that you can go to. They all almost everyone seems to you know go towards the forum to 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 hear like what's what the scuttlebutt is, what everyone is 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 talking about. And you know, it 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 seems to have grown in leaps and bounds. You know, not not only in terms of page views and stuff like that, but also to a certain extent, a little bit of notoriety here and there as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, if if I had it my way, if I could shape the world, the forum would be ninety nine percent skiers talking about the boring nitty gritty of psalm skiing. But the reality is, is it's the outrage of the day, right? I mean, what's what's top of mind with people is what gets discussed. You're kind of like the um, Drudge Report of uh, of water skiing, uh, it would seem. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I want that that title, but sure. Um, you know, it's administrating it is challenging. I, you know, as as we're in a politically charged environment in this country and internationally. You know, and, you know, people are passionate about stuff. Um, it's been a real challenge to run a website that is almost exclusively about water skiing, pretty much anything about water skiing, but, you know, not letting the outrage of the greater political arena come in. And, yeah, it's <laughs> – yeah. Yeah. So there's that. There, there, <laughs> there, there's that to take into consideration, you know, because, I mean – I mean, I mean, moderating a forum of that of of that kind of nature when it when where people you know have have, have opinions one way or the other, you've got to you. I mean, I'm sure you've got to you've got to actually take on the mole the the literally the role of moderator to make sure that it doesn't become so toxic that it uh, that it discourages from people from ever visiting or ever offering their opinions ever again is that correct it is it is paramount to me that it not become toxic um it is it has to be constructive um or it not only will it drive traffic away but i will cease to care if it's toxic i'm just i'm not interested in that toxic environment you know in some of the some of the big discussions i confess i don't read them i make sure that people are not insulting each other or they're not you know at some point, people are just passionate about stuff, and I, I let it run. But uh, it, it, as, as long as the conversation mimics the tone that you might find in a professional environment, I'll let it go. Excellent. That 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 that's that's something that's something I'm going to work back to. You know, because because uh, I mean, in the, in this day and age, you know, I mean, I mean, ba- I mean, back in the day when when online discussions and, and online conversations were like like were were basically email driven and you went to a certain chat room or something like that you know some most of the discussions were were quite civil because actually in that in, in that in that point of time people were mostly well educated enough to actually put something so, something out there that looked akin to a letter you know with all the gr- right grammar and everything going on but this day and age you a, a lot of a lot of people that that have that haven't had that experience or have never wanted that experience to start off with will just like fire off something and to in ju- just 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 to enrage someone into a response that that you know is quite frankly very very you know disconcerting to me yeah, there's no question. And, you know, there's – especially in, in an affinity forum, you know, or in a, in a in a web forum that's specific to a sport, um, even with the best intentions, there is an inverse relationship between s- many people's uh, knowledge versus um, – I'm screwing this up uh, – 
enthusiasm to knowledge ratio, right? Mm -hmm. There will be, you know, sometimes the people with the least knowledge are the most enthusiastic and the people with the most knowledge are the least apt to interact. Um, and, you know, parallel to that, you've got the famous uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. If you're not aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, you should you should Google it. It's quite humorous. It's the relationship of somebody's uh, knowledge versus their confidence. And again, people with very little knowledge tend to have the greatest confidence. So you get these conversations that are a little lopsided. Okay, I've just pulled up that uh, that expression on Google. As a matter of fact, Dunning it's Kruger, funny. Uh, Kruger effect in psychology: a cognitive bias where whereby people with limited knowledge or competence in a given an intellectual or social media or social domain greatly overestimate their knowledge or competence that the uh, that the domain relative to the object criteria or to the performance of their peers. Or of people in general. So basically, the people with the least education, uh, the the least least amount of knowledge or least amount of confidence about that knowledge are the ones that tend to comment the most and uh, try and ca cause a an absolute mm storm. Right, and 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 so here's the challenge: is my forget about keeping my advertisers happy, forget about anything else. I want the website to be a resource to the re to the to the world, not just the readership, but to the world, like. Like if somebody is trying to figure out whatever question about skiing, I mean, should they switch from double boots to a kicker? I want them to be able to come to the website and search around and dig and find good information. Whereas I think the, uh, I can't believe I'm just totally criticizing my readership. I'm just going to keep going for it. That's um, fine. My, my, my re <laughs> yeah, great. But my readership is largely there for entertainment. And, 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 you know, that's the conflict is I'm really – I really want somebody who's new to the sport, you know, to, to find good stuff. And sometimes that runs completely contrary to the entertainment of somebody that just wants to blather on with their opinion, which with my years in the sport, I'm usually often confident that their, their comments are misplaced. So I don't know. Obviously, I've I've thought about website administration or form administration quite a bit. Okay, so and so to, <laughs> so going on from there a little bit, and I've got and I've got some questions to ask about probably the the mo the most popular uh, forum uh, subject going on right now, which is running to forty pages. But uh, I'll, I'll put that aside for one moment uh, to to kind of kind of ask you in from this this perspective. And I'm probably coming a little bit of a criticism for this for this okay. myself, but here goes. Yeah. Do you believe wholeheartedly that, journal, that effective journalism exists within the sport of tournament water skiing? No. No. Okay. No, I, I think I, I think there's little pockets. I mean, I I believe. I mean, I think you do a good job, and I think that Trent and I's distance from center shows, which don't come out as often as they should, I think. I think we're pretty objective and honest, but generally speaking, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't think there's much of it, right? I mean, I think that that when you, uh, Waterski broadcast, when when you give your opinion, I don't think anybody questions the sincerity and honesty of what comes out of your mouth, and I hope people feel the same way about Trent and I, but there's not very much. Um, and you use the word journalism. There's so little journalism. Again, it's it's you and me and Trent and a handful of other people. Because I don't, I, I I don't know how people consume news. Because most of the stuff that that's published on like the national governing body website or that kind of stuff, you know, on uh, if you w go a little bit further, most of it is just like press releases or that type of stuff, right. and maybe yep. video press releases. But there's but for my part i don't seem to have i don't you know it's it's not like the nfl or mlb or mls or any or any of the major pro sports that many within our sport are try are, are, are trying to equate to and trying to close the gap between you know in terms of popularity you know there just seems to be a complete dearth of 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 journalism of reportage that could really potentially grow the sport if it's 
if it's a if it's effectively curated type deal. Yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I follow you on how journalism in the sport would grow the sport. Growing the sport is. Again, there's there's a four hour show in that argument. I'm not, and I don't have solutions. Um, it's just difficult. We're just a tiny sport. I mean, trying to trying to um, even even from the governing bodies for them to put out news. Unfortunately, the governing bodies pay their salary employees on sponsorship dollars. Um, I pay myself on sponsorship dollars. Uh, the Water Ski Broadcast Company. Mm-hmm. pays itself on sponsorship dollars and i'm not saying that that you've sold out and the and that people should question your opinions because i'm pretty sure you've never held an opinion back but we're a tiny sport it's it's really hard for you know for there being existence of uh unbiased news yeah, but what uh, the point that I'm making is that as the sport starts to get a little bit more traction through TWBC and through and through better better exposure through your website and uh, and and a lot of a lot of other people of uh, of, of, uh, of some people at least have tried to uh, you know extol the virtues of, of water skiing. There there just seems to be a lack of like. Of, of like a report that says like so-and-so skier you know a ski a skied for the title but had something to say uh, afterwards and then someone come, and then the person to whom he is he or she is referring to comes back with their comments and then they put like a little by byline and say that's a news report as you would typically find on like espn.com or something like that you know yeah, I just, I just think we're, I just think the ecosystem is too small. I mean, the, the, the famous, the famous example of, of kind of where you're going is you go back to two worlds ago when, when Jarrett spoke to the, the webcaster and he totally ripped the event organizer, uh, a new sphincter. And uh, yeah, that if, if we were, if we were Formula One or NFL, that would, there would have been a news cycle and multiple people would have written about it. I just, I don't, I don't know that that ecosystem exists. Am I, am I missing your point? No, no, absolutely, absolutely, and 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 I mean, I'm just trying to trying to explore the uh, the, uh, the the deal with that and what and what and the rationale behind their not having having enough journalism and uh, and yes, yes, you rightly say. I mean, there isn't a big enough ecosystem. I mean, we're we're trying our best to actually get to that point, and that is why why we put on the webcast and all that and all that kind of stuff uh, go, going on. So yeah, so. Going up, going along. But but but, but 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 to close this, your group and my group are doing the best we can, and I think that that the public would consume a little more um, if if somebody wants to tell us how we could create more noise. I think both you and I would listen. I just don't I don't know how we get there. Yeah, and it's how yeah how to create that noise, you know? Because I mean, we're putting every we're putting our staff out there. I mean, it's I mean it's on the most widely used uh, video streaming service out out there. It's there for a reason, you know. Not 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 because it's cheap or anything like that, but uh, but I mean, when people uh, type in World Water Ski Championship, boom, it comes up as on the YouTube page right. Right. with 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 all of the stuff. That's the primary reason why why we use that service instead of our own. Uh, own uh, own streaming uh, mechanism but let's uh let's con- let's continue on a, l- a little bit as well uh, uh, and and th- this this actually goes into the realm of, co- of of uh calling out maybe uh the national national governing body and, and national organizations around the world and i know i know john is probably uh salivate, salivating all of this or maybe the opposite but currently the uh the top uh the top stream the co- uh, top uh, thread going on right now is uh a lot of stuff going on with uh, USA water ski and wake sports, and and how it's and how it's mandating its membership to have to go through Safe Sport and a whole other bunch of bureaucratic uh, hoops just to be able to continue on with the sport that they that they've involved themselves and they and they, and they love you know and this has gone over 40 pages so far so a lot of heated discussion going on uh, uh your your uh, your take on that i have about six takes on it oh wow um, to to the 
to the membership, I feel the same way about, and this is my comment to the membership, I have the same feeling about the safe sport mandates as I do about the price of gas, right? Price of gas has gone up. Your, your ski ride just got a dollar more expensive. Uh, the safe sport mandate is an inconvenience. I'm not sure I believe in its effectiveness or value, but in all honesty, it's like 40 bucks an hour of your time. If the people who were complaining on my website had invested half as much time in just sitting down in front of the computer and taking care of it, instead of complaining about it, the problem would be solved. Mm-hmm. It's it's like um, it, it's like COVID right now. I mean, you can you can you can you can comment all you want about the efficacy of the vaccine or the or 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 the absolute need uh, to actually take it based upon your work environment or what have you, but. If you just go out there and take the vaccine and, you know, swallow a bit of your pride and get it done, then you don't then you can move on with your life, you know? Well, I disagree with you on that, but that's a different show. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. Uh, hit me with it. Come on. No, no, no. The vaccine thing. That's that's, you know, that's fine. Let's, but, let's but not do, go but, there. But do you see the parallels between the two? A well, little bit? Yes, yes. No, no, no. I think actually, yes. Yeah, I think that's wise. But but so let's talk about the this whole the whole safe sport mandate is it is parallel to the to things that have nothing to do with water skiing. In fact, it's largely not about water skiing. It is the litigious society that we live in, right? It is so so USA water ski. I I don't think USA water ski particularly has a choice, and that is something that I think is missed on so many people that are complaining. It's a USO, is, USOPC mandate, isn't it? Yes, yes. And, you know, I love the conversation. I mean, we can go down this rabbit hole of the mistake that AWSA made back in the 70s when they formed USA Water Ski because they believed that we were going to be in the Olympics. I mean, you go back to one of my notes in front of me, but was it – 68 or 72 that ricky mccormick or what what year was was munich munich was 72 munich was 72 montreal was 76 moscow the 80s right so so you know rick ricky ricky went to the to the olympics and won the gold medal and then came back and was on i believe the dick cavett show which came before the tonight show right it was back in the day and he's he was on there with the rolling stones and the muppets you can check me on that yeah and, i mean and, water and, skiing and yeah, just well, and well, just well, to, just to give you an uh, uh, just ju- just to just to interrupt you there for a moment the dick cavett show i mean for the, if you if you've ever seen forrest gump it's the scene where john lennon was sitting down next to forrest gump that's dick cavett but carry on right so, so the point is, is I mean, we in water skiing, we were the original extreme sport. So people like my father, this is one of the, the great mistakes of his life. He firmly believed, and, and the people on the board of directors with him, that we were going to become an Olympic sport. That, that so, so we had to jump through these hoops. We had to create USA Water Ski to become this umbrella organization. So we gave up a lot of our autonomy because at the time we were this – we were a single sport, slalom trick jump. That was our whole thing. But the belief that we were going to go to the Olympics made us join with show ski, ski racing, and then eventually wakeboard and kneeboard, Lord help me, and disabled, which I, I do actually support and collegiate. But we, so we formed this greater thing so we would be, so we would fit the template that allowed us to be part of the Olympic movement because we believe that. So so I I think that we, the the wheels came off the train then that led us to today where we have to meet the same criteria as all the other sports which are in you know subordinate to the Olympic movement. Yeah, I think a lot of people back in the 70s were probably were, were probably giddy with the whole uh, with the whole notion of actually being into the sport, but in my mind there was probably one thing back in those days that would that that they that would have been in place that would have would never allow water skiing back would never allow skiing into the Olympic games and that's the fact that back in the 1970s 
they still have a prohibition against professional athletes. And there, there, there was some professional athletes in the 1970s that were making money from the sport. But basically, uh, in the Olympic Charter, and this was supported by a guy named Avery Brundage, you know, he basically said, no professional athletes in the games, zilt, nada, nix, you know. And, and I mean, you, you had people like Jim Thorpe, who had to give, who had to give up their, their medals in, a, in early Olympic Games because he, he, made, he made a little bit of money through baseball and that kind of stuff. And it was only, until, it was only around about 1984 when you had the Olympic mm-hmm. Games in Los Angeles and a little bit afterwards that, that pro athletes, who were people who actually made just a smidgen of a living from what they're doing in sports were at least given a shot of being in the Olympic Games. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think, I mean, there really wasn't, I don't, you know, pro skiing sort of exists at that point. I don't think that that was the barrier. I think the original sin in my mind is this belief that we were going to become part of the Olympics, we were going to be on TV, and suddenly the sport was going to increase by 10 or 100-fold in membership and become, you know, a legitimate giant sport like snow skiing. And... I can understand where those guys had – how that idea came to be, but it was completely misplaced. And I don't – you know, you get you get out your time machine, you go back to 1975. Was it obvious it was a bad idea at the time? I don't know. I, I don't have the foggiest. But looking back 2020, I think that you, know, you can draw a straight line from safe sport in 2022 – to the creation of uh, USA Water Ski back in the 70s and, you know, losing our autonomy and, and putting ourselves underneath the Olympic movement. Okay. And- Let- okay, let's continue, let's continue on and just try and, try and put, put some bit of fairness in, in, into the deal. You know, I mean, I mean obviously, there's, there's a lot of ways that USA Water Ski and AWSA has kind of shot themselves a little bit in the foot so far as trying to get more exposure of a sport and more membership, you know, because the, the membership numbers have dropped considerably and they continue to drop uh, to this day. Is there anything do you, that you see within USA Water Ski and Wake Sports, as it's called now, and AWSA, do you see actually see anything that those guys have done within the last couple of seasons that has actually benefited the sport going forward? Oh, I mean, of course, of course. I mean, I, I, you know, I, you look at Jeff Serde, I know and endorse every one of his ideas, but man, do I appreciate that he stuck his neck out and tried some crazy stuff. Um, The fact that he brought, and I guess these are little things but the fact that he brought the equivalent of the U.S. Open and the America's Cup back to nationals, trying to make nationals more of an event that people aspire to get to. Because, I mean, if you think about the the desire to train and practice and buy equipment and get involved, this 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 path, this, uh, this goal of making U.S. nationals, having the America's Cup there as an event, I think, really um, – inflates that so yeah i mean there's you know stuff like that i think is fantastic as far as regular benefits to the to the membership i think there have been a lot of try attempts to make membership interesting for somebody who's not a tournament skier and i actually think that's all a boondoggle all right, yeah, because over the last few seasons, a lot of a, a lot of uh, a lot of things have changed in the sport. I mean, you've got your. I mean, now in order to run a slalom again event at the highest level, you've got to have shore path. You've got to have zero off. You've got to have got to got to have uh, a boat uh, a boat that's one of the approved boats uh, that's been used for the past couple of seasons, uh, or, or preferably that season type deal. So that so there seems to be a lot one or two obstacles in the way of some of someone who is actually getting into the sport from actually going uh, actually going in and competing towards towards the high, highest level now so do you do you feel do you feel that way as well that that there that there are just there are just way too many obstacles in place for the sake of creating obstacles 
for the sake of creating obstacles, no. I mean, like you talk about zero off. I think the transition to zero off, I I, I don't know that they could have done it better. Well, they, the, you go back to, I think it's 2008, the transition. Uh, or the, it was the first year of zero off. I think that was terribly managed and it drove people out of the sport. But now we have zero off and everybody that's involved in the sport agrees it's fantastic. And your boat has to be older than 2008 and have that original engine in it for it not to have zero off in it. So, you know, that pain has diminished, right? Right. And it's, yeah. it, right. So, and I mean, you know, and, and people are now, some people are rubbing their hands together, worrying about the advent of boat path monitoring systems, sure path and the lesser known ski path, which by the way is also very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't get it. Why would you, why would you not want to go to a tournament and know that your driver had to be more straight? And if you know, it's not again, you own a hundred thousand dollar boat, probably if you have a current year boat, if you're a, if you're a, taking your boat to tournaments, maybe, maybe it's a sixty thousand dollar boat. The the cost of if you're serious about your driving, the cost of one of these boat path monitoring systems, it's a chunk of change. But if you wanted an inexpensive sport, you'd be swimming. I mean, yeah. it's just, I, I, it, it's, it's, it, you know, I, I, I hate to be flipping about the way people spend money, but you, you just, you know, that there's a reason why you don't find very many people in the sport that are first year out of college. Yeah. Cause you know, you're, you're either mid career and you can afford the sport or your parents are paying for it. Absolutely. So these, these, these yeah, I, I don't know about these impedances. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. But are they necessary evils? I, I, I don't even know that they're evils at this point. Yeah, the necessities rather than necessary necessary evils, I guess. You know, so I mean, so I mean, we've we've covered we've covered a lot of lot of ground here. You know, so I mean, you 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 get to watch a lot of tournaments uh, through us and other and other vendors within mm. the sport. Obviously, the biggest tournament last year was the Worlds, where like the the greatest performances. It was like the great the greatest show on the greatest show on surf. Did you see what I did there? I did. I did. Yeah, the greatest show on surf. Well, not quite on surf. Uh, you can uh, it wake just doesn't or or spray or anything like that. You know, just doesn't have the same appeal. You know, I was trying to go for the old Mike Martz type deal, the greatest show on turf. But anyway, <laughs> but but I mean, uh, I I digress. The World Championships, some of the greatest performances ever 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 produced, and leading up to the World Championships. The IWWF, at least in the tournament committee, made some changes that that address some serious concerns in the sport. Do you think all of them have been have, have been addressed effectively, given what you saw with the World Championships? Uh, I'm not clear on what specifics you're talking about, Tony. So far as uh, 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 opening up the the. En- the the entrance uh, qualifications, you know, rather rather than being part of a yeah. team or rather being like high echelon, like ty- top twenty, top twelve in the world in order to be able to ski, they uh, they well, open that up. Yeah. You know, I know I know people that argued very firmly that that diminished the exclusivity and the specialness of worlds. Um, I don't know. It's I I kind of see it from a business perspective um that the the host site needs to make money on you know i'm sorry that's true but it is um so and i don't know what drove international to make that decision but from my perspective that allowed um the florida ski schools and especially travers to generate revenue from practice and it we want worlds at sites like Travers. Travers is fantastic. Oh yeah. So I don't, you know, I, 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 I know that, that having so many series, especially in men's slalom, uh, did create some other, um, controversies perhaps, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that I care that there was more skiers there. So if, if the tournament was tiny, is it more special? Yes. All the way out here on the West Coast, did I feel like it was less of a special event? No. Men's slalom at the 2021 Worlds 
was perhaps the greatest show ever in the history of the sport. What's not to like about Dane Meckler going through 41 off? Holy shit. Can I say shit on your podcast? Yeah, yeah, that that that's fine. I'm sure I'm I'm sure that It was uh... it, it it was a jaw-dropping event. It was you know, if you if you look at the memes of of Joe Rogan when he's commentating uh at UFC and I don't even really like that stuff, but he gets this fate look on his face where his eyes are popping out of his head. That was my face when, when Dane pulled that 41 out of his butt, it was just like, like what just happened? Did they forget to shorten the rope? No, they didn't. It was insane. That was a, that was a scream in the microphone moment right there. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that was a tremendous performance. I, mon- I monitored that all the way throughout, you know, and you know, and I mean, like, like slalom slalom and jump are like the blue ribbon event so far as tournament water skiing is concerned especially the world championships but and i think you mentioned this on the distance from center uh, broadcast that you that you have with uh, trent finlayson big shout out to both uh, to both of you for uh, for making that happen but overall has has made a bit of a resurgence not not only with the women's overall because i mean you've got the likes of uh of of uh, of anna gay and janina bonneman that have that have come through and uh sasha denya sky and of course anna stroltz over is there but i made a conscious decision going into the world championships as the announcer to really stay on top of the men's overall competition and it lived up to the billing certainly oh it's just fantastic dorian and um and poland I don't, you know, I, I think we have eras where where overall is interesting and then eras where there's one standout skier and crushes it and it's not very interesting. You know, you go back to my youth and it was Sammy Carl Patrice and it was a gunfight every don't, world's. Don't forget Mike Hazelwood. Well, I think, no, that's, that's, that's before Sammy Carl Patrice and who, I don't. Did Hazelwood ever win an overall? Yes, he did. He won the overall back in 1977. At is that in Toronto? Uh, that was in Milano. I was there. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit too young to. I mean, I was a huge Hazelwood fan as a jumper, but I don't I I, I don't appreciate him as a uh, as an overall skier. Although he did ski for Conley, and they are a major sponsor of Fall Spray, so thank you, Conley. <laughs> there you go, fantastic plug. The, plug those guys, but yeah, I mean, Mike Hazelwood won the World Overall Champion in Chip in 1977, uh, won the Jump in seven, uh, in, uh, in 79 and in 81, and uh, was in contention for the overall World Championship in 1987, where he had that infamous that infamous battle against him and Sammy Duval, that which escalated on the dock side. And I was actually there as, as a me- member of the crowd that watched on in horror, hmm. you know? So, I mean, it's yeah. Overall I, I, yeah. I, I, I miss it. Yeah. No, that's the point. I mean, Poland, Poland and Llewellyn are, I, I, I feel bad for the overall skiers. Cause I don't think people realize that they are, some of the most elite athletes in the world. You kind of you kind of wish these guys had gone to golf or tennis because they'd all be multimillionaires at this point, right? And I mean, both, so of them, both of them are just freaks. Uh, uh, any, I mean, I mean like like Dorian can can skate with the best of them ice hockey, and like I don't okay. I don't know what else uh, po, uh, Joel Poland can do physically in terms of sport, but I mean he's an absolute freak on a trick ski and any, or any other ski for that matter. Yeah, no question, no question. We're we're lucky to have those guys in the sport for sure. All right, then, as we continue to monitor the uh, the uh, the continuation of the sport with the, the great performances of Joel Poland and uh, and Torian Llewellyn, do you, is is there is there anything that you that you would like to see uh, move forward in the sport of, of, of tournament water skiing that hasn't seriously been addressed yet. I mean, we've, I mean, we've, we've touched upon politics. We've touched upon performances. Is that is, is there anything within some, somewhere in between that you think needs to happen for the sport to truly enjoy a uh, better than average exposure? Well, I, I don't know if this is where you're going and I'm going to put the listeners to sleep with this, Go, but I think that, <laughs> I think the trick points need to be completely rewritten. To what extent, higher or lower for something like a, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, for an 800 point uh, uh, front flip? 
uh, 800 point front flip is probably in the right place. But you look at sevens, you look at all the tricks that nobody does anymore. And, yeah, like a seven you know, front when, to front, like Corey Pickers exactly. could pull one of those, those those out of his out of his rear end at any given moment. But do you see a seven front to front? No, of course you don't. Right, it's too difficult. So you know the flip when when flip first became a trick, right? I mean, back in the it was the it was the eighties or early nineties when people were just doing one flip, five hundred point trick was that, a huge deal. Actually, there were a thousand points a piece back in those days. Uh, uh, with, yeah, no, I, I think I'd, it was close to, but I think it was certainly more than five hundred points. I know that. Uh, I had I had flip in my run in uh, whatever whatever. Um, but the point is, it was this huge trick, and now people learn flip before they learn fives. Yeah. Right. Fives. Fives are considered more difficult than some of the basic flips. Well, so so everybody is structured the way they learn tricks around the trick points. Like, well, I'm going to go learn flips because that's where all the points are. But are they really are are they really structuring trick points around what is hardest? And I mean, I know nobody's ever gonna do line tricks again, but I mean, there's a there's a double step, uh, wake line five line back. You start out you start out in uh, start out facing the boat. You do wake line back, turn front, and then get your leg over the line one more time before you turn backwards. And it's under 500 points. Hmm. Right? How is that? I spent like two whole seasons trying to learn it, never did it. Um, how is that harder than backflip? I mean, how how is that not harder than backflip? I mean, so and you you go, and 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 same with the ski lines, right? So the ski lines are all, I mean, really, you could, if if you ask the best trickers in the world to to order the tricks, hardest to easiest. I don't think it matches the points. That's that, that's my bottom line. And I mean, like several years ago, they had uh, skiers like uh, such as Patrice Martin and Jeff Carrington were doing ski lines with the foot out of the ski, oh. the back foot out of the ski, the the light, the, the classic line step. Uh, do you right, reckon right. they should be and, brought back? I'm not against it, but you know who did that the best is Carl. Oh yeah, I mean he was a tall drink oh. of water, so he had to get some oh. elevation to make that trick happen. Ah, he did that so good, and that's insanely hard. I again tried that a lot, never, never did make it. Yeah, no, I, I don't know that we need to bring more tricks back in. I mean, I think those tricks were fun, but I think the the sport has gotten stale because it's the argument of do we have six flips or like collegiate? It's unlimited flips, and these flips are hard, but. Again, when, when I go to a tournament and I see somebody do side, side, reverse, flip, reverse flip, I'm like, <laughs> seriously, come on. And, 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 and no toe tricks, right? I mean, tell me, tell me a toe step five, and I don't know what a toe step five is worth, but I'm sure that difficulty-wise, it's not proportional to flip half twist. Yeah, and I mean it's uh, it, it's it's just cra- it's just crazy pants. I mean today the to, uh, the the flip centricness of 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 tournament water ski tricks. You know, I mean it. I mean it's putting all of that value to the, to the invert and and hasn't addressed uh, the point values for some of the tricks that actually takes some genuine skill. To actually well, pull no, off. no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, look, look. Uh, flips are hard. I'm not diminishing them. I'm just saying that it's improportional. And you know, there was a time when people thought if we filled tr- trick rides with flips, trick skiing will be more entertaining to watch. More people will watch trick skiing. And I get that idea, but I still think if you know nothing about trick skiing, by the time you've watched your fourth open level skier, unless you're a, a fan of the sport, it's like taking somebody to a formula one race when they don't know who any of the drivers are, they watch the cars go around fast and like, ah, I don't know what the hell's going on. So all those flips did not make watching the event more interesting. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and actually, and I actually kind I, I didn't know what to make of the tricks events in the world championships this year. It was, it was more of uh, attrition based trick skiing, you know, because a lot of the skiers actually fell a good, a uh, 
halfway halfway through the runs and the last guy standing happened to be Dorian Llewellyn. I mean, I mean, hate to say it at this point, but wasn't exactly the classic men's trick in final that, uh, that I was rubbing my hands and looking forward to, so to speak. Yeah, women's tricks was pretty interesting, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh it always is, you know, when you've got Anna and, Gay and, and, and Erica. Neil. And Neely yep. and or, and Jan, and Janina Bonneman. I mean, well, Janina Bonneman this year not so much because she'd taken that horrendous jump crash in the in training before the worlds. But you know, it, it is it is what it was. And by the way, the toe wake, uh, toe what was it? The toe wake line five back, wasn't it? It's uh, six hundred points, and then toe wake line five front is seven hundred. Anyway, just to just just to just to clarify and, the points on and those. what's a and what's a flip half twist. Flip half twist. Is they, her... I'm not even calling it the right name. I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, what? Well, I mean, they call it the half jack, I believe, or or, or is that the Whatever. front flip uh, to the back? Anyway, I don't know. The, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of the trick skiers are trying to 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 meld a lot of the terminology that's in wakeboarding to suit suit tournament skiing, but I I suspect you're not a fan of that either. Oh, it's fine. Honestly, I'm not. You know, I. Did... Being anti wakeboard is silly, and I was that guy at one point in my life. But um, it's just not what we do. So, but if people want to learn the tricks on a wakeboard, put them do them on a trick ski. More power to them. All right, flip half twist to the back is seven hundred and fifty points. It just happened to have the trick scores in front of me. So but... it's the so it's roughly the same as toy line five. Yeah, exactly. So and so so yeah, you made the point. You know, no the uh, the flip twist to the back. You know, I mean, obviously there's there's a lot of skill enabled to being able to land that trick effectively and go straight into the next one. That's about the same as doing a toe wake a toe wake trick. No toe wake, toe wake line five back, you know, which requires a heck of a lot more skill and, and is actually 50 points less. Yeah, toe wake, toe wake line five back has got to be one of the more, most difficult tricks in the book. Yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, or the trick that I was referring to was the toe wake line five front, but anyway, it's seven. Right, even points. more, yeah, still. But there, but there you go. So, yeah, so we got, so really. Let's see. Let's see if the uh, the IWWF World Tournament Council can can actually address some of these points with the tricks to actually be to be more equitable uh, in terms of the skill that's required to actually do those tricks. You know, so they get the genuine points that they should actually yeah. be given for the skill that for the difficulty that is actually required to do those tricks. Yeah, nobody cares. Oh. <laughs> Nobody cares. I just, I just ranted for ten minutes about about trick points. I'm guessing half your listenership just reached out, just fast forward or off. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I doubt that very much because I, because I, because I, I honestly believe that there are some, there are some great fans of the tricking event, and I've, and I sincerely believe that the tricking. The tricking has made a, re- a resurgence a little bit in the last in the last few seasons. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it, it's it it's been exciting to watch, and uh, the world's best trick skiers more power for that more power to them for for bringing the sport up and uh, giving more exposure to it. In in my opinion, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious if there's been a resurgence in the amateur levels or not. Um, I mean, I know and the ski companies will tell you they they make as many trick skis as they can. I don't know. Yeah, may, maybe those gravitons are just like move, moving out of that factory up in Seattle, Washington. But there they, you go. They, they are. They are. I mean, I, you know, like the, the, the D3 and Radar and Quantum and uh, KD and a little bit of Goodman, I think they all make, I think they all sell as, just about as many Trixies as they can make. And Reflex as well, I believe. Did you make Reflex. Oh, Reflex as well. Oh, darn it. No. But there you Sorry, go. Sorry, Reflex. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Anyway, we're going we're gonna to put a uh, button on this. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. It's been an absolute thrill uh, to uh, to talk with you and basically shoot the breeze uh, with tournament water skiing. I'd love to have you back sometime during the course of the season because I'm sure there, there's going to be a lot to talk about uh, uh, halfway into 2022. But I normally give the opportunity for the interviewee to, uh, to, to, to thank people people or give acknowledgments and that kind of stuff so i turn it over to you for uh, for that bit well tony let me just thank you like uh you know we first talked before ball spray was a thing and you were trying to figure out some kind of media thing in water skiing and i've kind of watched you evolve and then the water ski broadcast company become a thing and then a bigger thing and 
Uh, at this point, I think you guys are the most important media outlet in the sport. I mean, I don't, I don't put myself in the same. I, I do something different. I think what you guys are doing is invaluable. You guys are setting the standard. I've seen you guys grow and improve and grow and improve. And I, you know, I don't know if I more want to thank you or congratulate you on the success. I, uh, I look forward to years and years and years of Warski broadcast and uh, uh, drives my wife nuts because I definitely. During ski season, I carve out weekends, and it's like, well, I got to sit in front of the TV and watch the tournament all day. So thank you and uh, the rest of the guys uh, at uh, Waterski Broadcast. Well, I mean, in that, in that respect, I think she should be thankful for Zero Off because that's dubbed the marriage saver, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I still can't get my wife to drive the boat. Oh, never mind. Oh. <laughs> All right, then. That was uh, John Horton. I'm Tony Lightfoot. This has been the latest edition of the TWBC podcast. So until next time, it is ciao for now. Thank you for listening to the TWBC podcast. Be sure to check out our website at waterskibroadcasting.com. Links to our presence on major social media platforms can be found there, as well as updates to our webcast and this podcast. Duplication or rebroadcasting of this broadcast without written consent of TWBC is prohibited. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to join us next time for the next edition of the TWBC Podcasts.